message needs to go forth and to go out. And today, I'm going to start it with uh, with with the sermon. And I, I basically said I wouldn't feel I would need to uh, uh, preach a sermon focused on this topic because I feel everyone understands this perfectly clear. But yet, once again, I'll have to eat those words. So today I'm going to talk about prayer. And what a greater, uh, 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 probably no greater subject to bring in 2018 than prayer. And, and I'm, I'm doing this for one reason, because I'm really concerned for a lot of things, in particular uh, the church, the, our, our young people, Many, many things, many attacks from Satan, and I don't care what program we have working, nothing's going to work. I'm not going to be able to preach a sermon that's going to accomplish. There's a song not going to be sung. If there's going to be a mighty move of God once again in the church in America, it's going to develop out of time of prayer. So I'm not going to put any pressure on you. I may get into your business a little bit today. And that's going to have to be okay because God got into my business. And trust me, it's a lot better when I get into your business because I'll just sit and leave you alone. God doesn't work that way. He'll just keep after you until you either say, I'm not doing this, or you begin to change and to line up with what the Lord is speaking to you. So we're, we're, we're going to talk about not just prayer, but intercessory prayer. Everyone here probably prays. Probably every day. I don't know how many of us offer intercessory prayer, and it's not your fault. We have been taught in the Christian world for the last 50, 60, 70 years that we are the focus. Now, we didn't use words like that, but that's what we were taught. It's that, that we need to have prosperity. We need to have health. We need to have a good family. We need to have a good job. Everything in our life must flow great. And when it does, then we must be walking with God. And when it doesn't, then we must be walking contrary to the Word of God, which is absolutely not true. Because I will tell you something, Satan is very, very good at his job. Much better at his job than we are at ours. And I will tell you that if you start getting into his business, he'll get into your business. And how you get into his business is when you start following the perfect will of God in everything that you say and do. And especially if you start bowing a knee in prayer, you are shaking the gates of hell and Satan will get in your business and cause you, listen, not only cause you a bad day, he's not concerned about you having a bad day. Satan wants to kill and, dis and steal and destroy. If you've got a, 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 a marriage, he wants your marriage. If you've got kids, he wants your kids. And I will tell you, at an alarming rate, he is breaking marriages up. And at a greater alarming rate, he is getting our kids. My kids and your kids. He's getting them. And I know my kids are grown and they're serving God, but there's a lot of these kids that go to this church that I almost count as my kids. And I'm going to tell you, he's going to, if he's not got them, he's going to get them if we don't get down to business with God. So we, this, this is an area, intercessory prayer is a weapon that the church has forgotten about. And, and maybe it's because we got lazy or maybe we've been duped. Whatever the case may be, we've lost it. And the church has gone amok. And we're not hearing the Word of God. You might say, Pastor, how do you know we're not here? Turn, turn the TV on. Turn the radio on. I'm talking Christian TV. I'm talking Christian radio. Turn it on. Let me tell you, when, when is the last time you begin to hear people preach heartfelt sermons that 
the church in America needs to be called to repentance. That the church in America is running amok. You're not hearing the message. That's the reason I know. There is no way we could be introducing the things into the body of Christ without the Lord ascending the Holy Spirit into the devil over time to start convicting hearts. He's trying to convict hearts, but we are not here. If we were, we would be changing some things. And we're not hearing is because our relationship is lacking a very important component, and that's communication with Him. So today, again, I'm going to try not to linger on in this, but I am going to I am going to bring some points out. I'm going to use the example you find in Exodus chapter 17, I think verses 8 through 16. It's a story, an event in the Bible that's very, very, very familiar. But the things that I'm going to bring out into this, this event in the Bible is, is number one, is that you can't do it alone. Number two, there are components that must be uh, 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 must be present. There's a lot of working components into the victory. Yes, folks, we've been taught you pray, you pray in the name of Jesus, victory is assured. Let me ask you, when's the last time that victory has just been overflowing in your house? See, what we don't, what we don't. Uh, 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 are not being told and what we don't realize they are parameters in which the Holy Spirit in which God works and He will not work outside of those parameters. And I talked a little bit about that in, in Sunday school this morning and speaking about Daniel at 14. How at the age of 14 could Daniel know to do what was right but not only know what to do was right but, but could say no to this, no to this or yes to this and yes to this and no to that. How did he even know this? Because somebody had spent some time through prayer and, and teaching to get Daniel to that point at 14 years old. He could stand true to the Word of God because he was hearing and understanding. We've got to get back to that frame of mind and to that type of relationship with the Lord. Listen, guys. On our best day, and are walking in the perfect will of God, we're still going to have problems. <coughs> People are still going to get sick. Our family is still, you, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there was no greater saint than my mother, and she still died. So, at the best, and we're walking in the perfect will of God, Satan is still going to attack because you are. Uh, uh, bringing an onslaught against Him, and He is going to respond. Many times pastors would tell me, you, you probably don't need to say that part, that would cause other Christians to want to back down and not do anything if they know it's going to cause a response from Satan. But I will tell you, it will. Go to India, and you go into these, these pagan cities. I remember seeing these huge statues and, and this week they were offering sacrifices to one goddess and, and they would sacrifice animals and the blood was going through the trenches of the city and, and, and you would go in there for a time of prayer well you better believe when you went into these areas for prayer there would be a backlash Satan would be attacking somebody in that group if not everyone so we're going to have to get ourselves equipped. And it's not going to happen without prayer. Prayer is the ABCs of a Christian life. And intercessory prayer is going to have to be a huge part of this. Why is this such a great need today to redevelop re, uh, this, this great weapon that's lost? Is we are living in the last days. Whenever I was in Chicago, and I was in Atlanta, and I was in Michigan, and, and one of the messages that I brought to, to the churches up there was to, to lay out a, 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 a series of events connecting dots and why this is the generation 
that will see Jesus Christ return. That's a fact. It's going to happen. Unfortunately, today we're experiencing some great things in the stock market and many people, even the church, feel that, that victory and that we're doing better because the stock market is doing well. I'm going to tell you, uh, the Christian church is in terrible trouble no matter what the stock market is going to do or not going to do. So we, we've got to get to work on getting this taken care of. Exodus chapter 17. Let's, let's get into the meat of this. We'll get in. We'll get out of here. And we'll get uh, business. Because the, the job here is to equip the saints. And then you and I, all of us together, are to go out and to... Uh, uh, evangelize the world. So we've got a work to do, but while we're here, we must learn what the Word of God says. So in chapter 17, we're going to pick it up at verse number 8, a very familiar subject. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out and fight with Amalek, Tomorrow, and I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said, and he fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of the altar Jehovah Nissi. And he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So we have an event a crisis, whatever you want to call it, is getting ready to happen. A lot of similarities from this event to even today where we are. Actually, uh, that's why the Bible is so unique. It's always relevant for the day and time in which we are living. And it always has an answer on how we can overcome and endure and be more than conquerors. The Bible tells us we are more than conquerors. It has this. The church is just not operating, or the American church is not. And, and I'm not here picking on the church. I'm a realist. I am the most pro-church you will ever meet. I love the church. I, I love the American church. But we must admit that she has gone astray. It's because she's not here, and she's grasping at straws, trying to do anything and everything to, to win the people, anything and everything but the thing that we need. So, in this event, we see a crisis. And with the crisis, there's always a warning. Do not be deceived. And what I mean by that, when there's a crisis, no matter if it's a sickness, no matter if it's illness, no matter if it's financial, a, a, a family problem, no matter what the crisis is, there's always lurking in the background a deception. And that deception, for the most part, is there to cause us to bring all of our focus on the crisis and get it off of the cross. And when that happens, the crisis gets bigger and overwhelming and before you know it, we don't even know what to do anymore. We, it's, it's just so huge and so big. So we have to be careful. We must not focus on the crisis, but we must focus on the thing that's going to bring victory. Now let me clarify this. 
When I say victory, I'm not necessarily meaning that that you're going to you're going to be comfortable. I'm not even going to put you or me in the equation. We're talking about intercessory prayer. That means that we're standing in the gap. We're praying and interceding to God on behalf of someone or something. And that's what intercessory prayer is. And, and very few times does that mean that person is me. But see, in America and also the church, we've been told, be all that you can be. Do what you want to do. I mean, Burger King has the slogan, the slogan have it your way. We have grown up in this type of thinking, so it has crossed right over into our spiritual life. So now, I, I just read something on, on uh, one of my Christian emails the other day, and it talks about, uh, uh, are you ready for what God is going to do for you? Are you ready for what God is going to teach you and what He's going to do if you have this kind of faith? And it's, uh, it's all about us. And even though there's some truth to that, but all of these byproducts of the good things that come to us should be that byproducts of what we're doing and should not be the goal of why we're doing it. If you're following me. So there, there has to be a breaking down of process. And this will happen not from a sermon being preached. Hopefully it will cause something to in, in your life to start thinking that, that maybe I need to change some things. But it will come because of the Lord dealing with you through prayer. So we see here there is a crisis lurking. The crisis here is there is war is imminent in Israel. And, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, Moses is still on the scene. Now in this key of victory, you have four components or four people that you'll find in the Scripture. I just love when the Scripture gives you great detail. First of all, you've got Joshua. Got to have him. Then you have Moses. you got to have Moses. But not only Moses, but you've got to have Aaron and you've got to have her. They're very important components because many times we can't win a battle by ourselves. We say, Pastor, I can just pray at home. I'm telling you, sometimes we can pray at home and sometimes we're going to have to come together because sometimes in intercessory prayer, we cannot do it alone. The Bible is bearing this out. We can either accept it or we can reject it. But you have another important component to this victory, and it's the stone. And we'll talk about the stone very briefly, but we'll talk about a few moments and, and the importance of this stone. But also the stone, it's, uh, Aaron is important, Er is important, Joshua and Moses are all important. See here, with this, you first have Joshua, who is the soldier that's going to battle, and you have Moses that's going to pray. And I want to lay this out just in case you think, okay, I'm the one going to battle, I don't need to pray, or I'm the one praying, I don't need to go to battle. No, in my home, my wife is a prayer warrior. That doesn't mean I don't pray. In my home, I'm the one that's going to battle. That doesn't mean that she doesn't battle. So that means that I'm probably doing more battling than her and she's probably doing more praying than I am. I'll just be honest with you. Because sometimes when my wife's praying, I just sit and listen to her pray. Have you ever listened to a prayer warrior pray? Oh my goodness. You'll get in the, you'll, you'll get in the mood to pray just listening to them pray. It, it's quite amazing. But, but these are components that are needed. You need Moses and you need Joshua. But Moses is going to have to have some help. Now it's quite evident that Joshua's going to have help. He's got soldiers. They're getting ready to go to war. They're getting ready to be attacked by Amalek. Why is Amalek going to attack Israel? They were feeling threatened. They were feeling threatened by Israel. I will tell you today, the mainstream church is feeling threatened by the conservative, the people that are hanging on to the truth of God's Word that refuses to deviate and to compromise. And you may say, Pastor, I don't see it. Sure you do. You just don't know what you're looking at. 
it's, and, and, and I'm not talking just about homosexuality, but everything. It's not that they that that they want uh, uh, that that they care if I if I like it or not. They're not happy if I like it or not. They want me to approve it. They want me to stop preaching against it. They want me to go along with their lifestyle, whether it's lying, cheating whether it's homosexuality, whatever the case may be, and they're feeling threatened. So guess what? Just like we see in Scripture, how most people react when they feel threatened is they attack. And the attacks can be very, very vicious, as it was in this case. You read a little bit of the history of this, of this battle, you'll find out they even attacked the, the, the handicapped and the helpless. It didn't matter. They were out to destroy and to annihilate. And I'm here to tell you, today Christianity at its purest form is under an all-out attack, especially in the United States of America and in Europe. It's there. And they're aiming to wipe this ideology from the face of the earth. Moses had a plan. He said, Joshua, you go and get some men and you go fight. And he said, and I'm going to go to the highest hill that is here and I'm going to pray. In my mind, I'm thinking that no matter how high that hill was, not only you could see him, but you could hear him. They'll know. Because Moses was going to pray, and he was going to pray aloud. If some were out of hearing distance, he also had another weapon that they would know that he was going to pray. He had a rod in his hand. And he said, when you see my hands lifted, you know that I am praying for you. I'm telling you today, there is no greater weapon, no greater request than to let the people that are fighting the battles know that you're praying for them. I got a, and I'm sure he doesn't, he doesn't mind me sharing this with you. I got a text about 11 o'clock last night from Representative Keesling, and he's not a representative out here. He does not represent the people out here. And if I had my phone, I'd read you the text because first and foremost, he was asking for prayer during this session. And he was, and he, and he wanted to thank, thank the church for praying and, and keeping him in our prayers as he does. His work that he does as a representative of the state of Tennessee. Understanding the power of prayer. And I and I texted him back and reminded him that we are praying for him. So I made a promise to Representative Keys. And you know what else I did? I made a promise to uh, the fever. Give me the boy's name. Jesse. Jesse. Sorry about that. I made a promise to Jesse that I would be praying for him. Moses made a promise to Joshua. And he said, and, and, and Joshua, when you see my hands lifted, you know I'm fulfilling my promise. He said, I will pray. And he did. Moses said, Joshua, you go fight. I'm going to pray for you. And he did. Let me get to say that one more time. Moses told Joshua, I'm going to pray for you. And he did. How many times have we told people that we are going to pray and we did not? Now folks, they are people that are going through some stuff that need to know that you're going to fulfill your promise and pray. 
And if you think that someone else will pray so it won't matter if you pray or not, then that other person's also thinking that so no one's praying. We must be praying. Regardless if you feel that, that you are a prayer warrior or not, we must be praying. All of us are commanded to pray. But then we look, the Lord still had a lesson that the Israelites needed to learn and that we must learn again today in the church. He told, he told Joshua, when my hands are up, I'm praying, and you are to advance. When my hands go down, then that means I'm not praying, I'm too tired, and you must retreat because the, the, the army of the Amalek uh, 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 the Amalekites are coming and they will come after you and destroy you. So you must retreat. But what I'm going to do is I'm also going to take ben, Aaron and her up there with me because I need some help. Folks, here comes in the corporate things. We need each other. We cannot do this alone. If you think that you're going to win this by doing it by yourself, you're already setting yourself up to fail. That's why victory is hard to find in the church anymore is because we're, if we're a church 200 strong, we're 200 individually strong. Not one strong man. But the Lord had something to teach them in this example. He needs to instill in them that when Moses' arms were up, representing holding this rod up unto God, meant that Moses was interceding to God for them, that victory was only happening because of the prayer Moses was praying the victory was coming from the Lord and the Lord alone. Not a sermon, not a song, not a, not a lesson. It was coming from the Lord alone and this was being done through prayer. I'm not, I'm not going to do it, so don't get nervous, but sometimes I'll tell you, I've thought, I, I get so concerned over what's going on in our church and, and folks and our kids. Oh my goodness. Our kids. Are they going to heaven? Really? Your child. Is your child going to heaven? And if they are, why? Why? We better get her. We better get broken. Sometimes I, I thought maybe I would just cancel the preaching and cancel the music and cancel the Sunday school, and when everybody gets here, we just pray. And then I got to thinking. I was being honest with myself. I got to thinking. Well, if I attended that church and that's all you done, I probably. Leave. Because sometimes we forget what such a weapon of prayer is and we just we just kind of push it to the side. It is serious. The deception's running high and today our kids are the prize. They're either going to be saved for the kingdom of heaven or they're going to be sacrificed to the pits of heaven. This is real. This is not some fairy tale story. And just because the newspaper said they went to heaven doesn't mean anything. So we've got we've got Four people in this 
in, in, in this strategy of victory. You have Joshua, Moses, Aaron, and Hur. Well, there's another one that's not named, but we know who it is. The Bible says that they took a stone and rolled it in to support Moses. That stone is Jesus Christ. It's exactly, it's a reminder that, that the Lord has got this. We do not have to walk in victory. We can have the strength. Folks, let me tell you something. The Bible says that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. Do you know why that's true? Because I'm not the church by myself. You're not the church by yourself. I can be having a weak time. I could be the one under attack. And the rest of the church is still moving strong and moving forward when we walk as one body. Because Jesus Christ is our strength. So we can have strength always. We never have to succumb to the, the onslaught of the devil. That's why the Lord says that we are more than conquerors. And if you're the one that's getting beat up, then we come together as a group. Now, I've terribly messed up in that area, and so have you. How many things have you went through nobody's been there? How many things have I went through no one to have. Now sometimes it's our own fault. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes the reason we don't know is because we don't spend any time together. And I can tell you, I don't get into Tommy and Christie's business, but as much as they let me know, and if I know that there's something going on down there, I'm going to be quick to offer some kind of help. And just the same there. Tommy just called me yesterday. He knew. He knew I was stressed. I'm not even going to tell you what I was stressed about. Oh, was I was stressed. And I probably said things about people I shouldn't have said. I was stressed. Tommy called me and he said, if there's anything I can do, you need me to come and to help you with whatever it is you're doing. And I knew he would have come. This is the attitude we're going to have to have. Not only in the physical, but in the spiritual. We're going to have to do it. If not, Jesus warned us in the last days that the deception was going to be so great that he basically paints a picture that, that it's going to be all that you can do to not be deceived. Folks, if that is the case, if we do not incorporate prayer back into the church, the church is going to be deceived. It's going to be. But it doesn't need to be. The stone is Christ. He is the rock of our lives. He is our he is our rest. He is our security. And He is our foundation. The psalmist says it this way, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And I'm telling you folks, there have been times when it appears that we need God more than we've ever needed. And today is that day. Overall, the day is today. The church needs the remnant to stand up and to stand strong. But before that, they need the remnant to fall on her face before God. Moses couldn't do this alone. He had to have help. We need each other. Bottom line. We can't do it alone. And at the end of this, we often forget in our victories. The Lord had Moses, or Moses did it on his own. He erected a memorial and he called the place the Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. 
I'm not saying we need to go and erect stones, images, but we need to erect a memorial in our heart with reasons for this. Number one, as a remembrance of what God does. And then, when Satan attacks again, because he's going to, you can remember. You can remember how you got the victory before. Problems change, solution stays the same. Remembering how you won that is going to be priceless, to say the least. Listen, I can look out through the audience and I know I'm, I'm constantly up here telling you everything that's going on and what kind of shape we're in and we are in bad shape. And, and, and we need to know that judgment's coming. I can make a case for Jeremiah preparing people that they were going into bondage. I can make these cases from the Word of God. We need this, but I'm going to tell you, we, we also have people that's, that's suffering with problems in their life that's not associated with what's going on in the country. We all have them. What problems are you going through? What problems am I going through? See, right now, I have a brother-in-law, a dear, dear brother-in-law. 16 years ago, he was diagnosed with kidney cancer, and he lost a kidney. 16 years ago. A few weeks ago, they found a mass in his kidney. And now my understanding, they found something in the lymph node and his lungs. He's only got one kidney left. See, somebody's got to stand an ancestry for that family. Because right now, this is Melanie's dad. Right now, Melanie can't do that. She's broken. The church is going to have to. I remember when it was D, it was not the time to ask Wayne and D to stand and be strong. Granted, I thought they stood it pretty good, but yet they were not able to withstand. They needed somebody to intercede. Somebody would say, you know, they've got a greater need than I have. Christy Gallagher, the same thing, and the list goes on and on and on. See, we know how to do it. But we're going to have to do this, and it's going to have to become part of our everyday life. It's nothing new. We're going to have to because I'm going to tell you what's going on here, and I mean, and, and I can say this because this is my family. This is nothing but a distraction. That's all it is, now. I don't know what the end result's going to be. It's the same it was with mom. It was nothing but a, dis a distraction and a crisis that the Lord was trying to get my focus off of him and on my mother and now on my brother-in-law. And while yet I'm still going to be concerned here, my focus is going to stay here because without him there is no healing. Now thank God he's a Christian man. But we're not ready for him to believe yet. Prayer. Intercessory prayer. A, a, a prayer that is, is showing your unselfishness. That time that the church used to be where it was more about the person there than the person here. And more about the person there than the person there. It was more about someone else than it was us. And things worked much better. Much better. I need you. And I think you need me. God designed me to work this way. about to give you a try. Now, I didn't say all that to say this, but this is what I'm going to do personally. Starting Thursday morning, I'm going to be here at 8 o'clock and I'm going to pray. 
if other people show up when they have a group prayer and then we're going to we, we want to kind of keep it all on the same basis but then we're going to separate if there's others that want to pray that can't come at 8 o'clock I'm going to be here Thursday at 6 30. I'm going to keep try to keep this in about 30 minutes if you don't come you'll never hear a word from me you will not hear a word I'll send a text out this week because it's brand new but after the word gets out you won't even get a text I don't want anyone to feel guilty this is not the purpose of this but at the same time folks I'm telling you we are in day and time if something drastic doesn't change we are going to lose so much so many of our family members not to death but eternity and I'm not going to sit idly by and watch that happen while I sit in my office or I'm, I'm, I'm at some meeting that I can postpone. And outside of some type of true emergency, I will be here. Something that's out of my control, I'll be here. But even if I'm not, you can. We've got to do something. And the only thing I know to do is pray.